So thank you, Fred, and I'm really excited to be here speaking to you this morning, um, in part because what I do for most of my time is sit behind a computer and run three-dimensional simulations of exoplanet atmospheres, and today I get to play with a whole bunch of toys <laughs> that the wonderful people in the demo lab have set up and adjusted and will make sure that I do not ruin. Um, and also, as Fred wonderfully introduced, I'm really excited to tell you about this field because exoplanets as a subfield of astronomy did not exist 20 years ago. And not only are we now aware of many, 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 many exoplanets, but we can even measure properties of the atmospheres of these exoplanets. And so it's a really kind of fantastic, amazing, new, continually impressive field, and I am, can't wait to tell you all about it, as much as I can in the limited amount of time I have. <laughs> so it's worth, though, taking a step back and thinking about what our picture of planets was 25 years ago. And this was it, right? These were the planets that we knew about, our own solar system planets. And we actually had kind of a good understanding of what planets were like, how they formed, how they behaved, based on this single example of a planetary system. Spoiler alert, exoplanets has completely disrupted this, <laughs> as I'll describe. But we thought, we understood, that you basically have kind of two kinds of planets. You have small terrestrial planets, which are these four that sit closer in in the solar system. They're composed mostly of rock and solid material with a little bit of an atmosphere on top. And then you have the gas giant planets, which are much, much larger, composed mostly of gas and ices, maybe a little bit of rock deep in the core. And we also had the understanding that the terrestrial planets orbit pretty close to the star. Remember the scale in this bottom plot is the size of the star is not actually to scale. But they sit very close to the sun and then spread much further out are the gas giant planets. Very nice, very clean picture. Still plenty of interesting things we haven't figured out. There's really interesting work going on in planetary science studying the planets in our own solar system. But with the discovery of exoplanets, we've had to think a little bit more carefully about whether we really understand planets and what other things we might need to think about. So one way of framing this is to say to ourselves, what properties of planets, of a planet, do I need to know to be able to fully describe that planet? To be able to say, I understand what that planet is like. So for example, you might say, Maybe it's the, ra the radius and the density of the planet, right? Maybe we have the small terrestrial planets that are high density versus the gas giant planets that are low density. Well, that's not enough information because if, for example, we compare Venus and our own planet, they're about the same in terms of radius, but they have vastly different conditions, right? We're sitting here enjoying a nice Saturday morning. You might complain about it being cold, but much better than the hellishly hot, lethal conditions if we were sitting on Venus right now. So in that case, you might say, well, maybe now we need to know something about the temperature of the planet, the composition of the atmosphere, and able to, enable, in order to be able to say that Venus and Earth, in fact, are significantly different. And then if we consider the planets on the far end of the solar system, Uranus and Neptune, sorry folks, there's no Pluto here. <laughs> yeah. Just looking at these two planets, you might say, they are identical. They're both blue spheres. Except that we know a little bit more information. We know that Uranus is tilted such that its orbital axis is in the plane that it orbits which is very different from the other planets. And this might give us a clue somehow about what happened to this planet um, when it formed or throughout its lifetime that created this tilt. 
And so by knowing a little bit more information, we can actually say, yeah, there is a difference between these two planets. So I'm not gonna actually give you an answer to this question. This is an active area of research. This is something we are trying to figure out as we study planets. And a particularly important aspect of this question is the neighboring question, what is observable? Because in all of these instances, I've been describing things that we know about the planet, things that we can measure about the planet. And so the more detail we know, the more we can discriminate between planets, and the more we may need to discriminate between planets. If we didn't know the rotational tilt of Uranus, we would not actually say that there's necessarily much of a difference between Uranus and Neptune. And this is especially important for exoplanets because we're, again, still figuring out what we can even observe about them. So, let's move straight on to all these planets we've found. Every dot on this plot represents an exoplanet that we are very confident exists orbiting one of these stars up in the sky. And I'm showing you when each of these planets was discovered, starting in 1995 with the first planet found around a sun-like star. And first of all, you can see there's quite a lot of them. <laughs> I'm also showing you on the vertical axis here the mass of these planets. For most of the planets we discover, at least for quite a while, for most of the planets we discovered, we knew their mass. That's one of the basic properties that we know, and I'll describe that in just a minute. But this axis is actually a little bit not useful because these are numbers that are huge. I'm plotting it in, related to the Earth's mass, and you can see you've got hundreds or thousands of Earth masses, and what does that actually mean? And Jupiter is about 300 Earth masses, so the very bottom slice of this plot contains all of the planets that are anything like our solar system planets. And so we can adjust the plot in a way that scientists enjoy doing and change the vertical axis to be logarithmic. And this means that instead of each tick mark being the addition of a constant number, each tick mark is the multiplication of a constant number. And so this is what that ends up looking like. And so this stretches out the bottom part of the plot so we can see it more clearly. And I've also labeled here for you where Jupiter, Neptune, and the Earth sit on this plot in terms of mass. And so one thing you can see is that over time, we are not just discovering more and more planets at a, at a faster and faster pace, but we also are refining the techniques that we use in order to get to the harder to find planets, the ones that are smaller and less massive. And I wanna point out something very important which is you see lots of dots down in the last few years right around an Earth mass. Just because a planet has the mass of the Earth or even the radius of the Earth does not mean that it is like the Earth. A lot of these planets sit far closer to their star than our own Earth and so are way too hot to be habitable. Some of them sit farther away and are too cold and it's a very difficult question to figure out how to observationally tell that a planet could be habitable. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but you can keep that in your mind a little bit as I'm talking about atmospheres, because the atmosphere of a planet, the better we can understand the atmosphere, the better we can understand the conditions on the planet itself. So a lot of the work that we're doing right now on bigger planets will be applied to these smaller planets that we're finding that could potentially be habitable. Okay, so in addition to finding all these planets, the really exciting thing from my perspective is that we're also measuring their atmospheres. And the first detection of an exoplanet atmosphere happened in 2002. So this is an even younger subfield of astronomy and a very exciting one. And we've moved on, not just from detecting atmospheres, but to measuring properties of them. And so we are in an era where we're moving from a focus on discovering these planets, although of course a lot of work is still being done to discover more and more and in different ways, but we're moving to characterization of these planets. 
being our focus, understanding what they're like. Now, this first exoplanet atmosphere detection happened around one of the planets that's nearby and big, and we can make lots of measurements, and so we've learned lots of things about this planet. It is called HD 209458b, and it's one of my favorites. <laughs> but you guys may not enjoy that name as much as I do, and so change it. The International Astronomical Union, the International Astronomical Union, which among other things is uh, responsible for officially giving names to astronomical objects, has decided to have this contest where members of the public can vote on different possible names and um, astronomy organizations can submit names to be voted upon. And I think this is pretty exciting and cool and fun. And so some of us here at Michigan are working with the Ann Arbor Hanson Museum to try to engage the Ann Arbor public about this. Um, we still have a ways to go. We don't actually have to vote on anything yet, but I want to put that on your radar because eventually we are going to be talking to you again about this. If you're curious or would like to be involved in any way, check out the Facebook page. Okay, let's get back to the science. So how do we actually see these planets? Well, we don't see this. We don't see a planet sitting next to a star, right? Because when we look up in the night sky, we don't see the star itself on the sky. What we see, because it's so far away, is a point of light. And so seeing this planet next to it is virtually impossible. It would be similar to if I were to look at one of these spotlights and look for a little firefly next to it except take that spotlight and that firefly and move it across the country. Very difficult. And so what we end up doing in most cases is we actually, instead of seeing the planet, we see the planet's effect on the star. So the first way that that's done, which is a little bit complicated, but you may be familiar with it because it's the technique that was first used and has been used for the last couple decades, is what's known as the Doppler method. And I'm going to go through this because I'm going to um, I'm going to invoke these same physics to talk about atmospheres a little bit later, so pay attention. There's a few different things that are combined in using this. One is that when the planet orbits the star, what's actually happening is that the planet and the star are orbiting their center of mass of the system. And so this means as the planet's orbiting the star, the star's actually wobbling a little bit around as well. Okay, so the star's moving. We can't actually see that. We can't make an image and see the star moving around on the sky because it's a very small effect. Okay, well, there's a different way we can measure motion, and that is through the Doppler shift. And what the Doppler shift does is when an object is moving relative to us, the frequency of light or sound that it emits gets shifted to higher and lower frequency as it's moving towards or away from us. And so if we take a stellar spectrum, which is what's shown on the top there, and you look at those particular little black lines, which I'll describe more later, but they're very particular wavelengths or very particular frequencies, those lines all get shifted to shorter and longer wavelengths, higher and lower frequencies, as the planet orbits. And so you watch those lines shift back and forth, and you get an idea that there's a planet orbiting there. And so now I get to do my first demo, try not to kill myself or anyone else. And so here I'm gonna show you the Doppler shift, but I'm gonna use sound instead of light, because it's a lot easier to do. And so this is gonna start making a very annoying noise at a very particular frequency. And so I want you to listen carefully as I have this planet orbit me. I'm seeing some nodding heads. So you should be able to tell that as this is coming towards and away from you, you're hearing the pitch shift up and down. And you should also be realizing that it's happening at a very regular pattern related to the orbit. <laughs> and so from that very regular pattern, you can tell the difference between a period that's longer and a period that's shorter. And 
so we do the same thing except with light and spectra of these stars. We pay attention to how much the pitch is shifting back and forth, and that tells us something about the mass of the planet, and we pay attention to how long it takes for the shift to go back and forth, and that tells us about the period of the planet, and the period of the planet, how long it takes to make a single orbit, is directly related to how far the planet is from the star. So we know the mass of the planet and how far it is from the star based on this technique. And remember, this is an indirect technique. We're using what's going on with the star to figure out what's going on with the planet. Now another indirect technique, it's a little bit easier to understand, I think, is the transit method. So in this case, we're staring at a star, and we are lucky because there's a planet orbiting it, and the planet orbit is aligned just right that from our perspective, it passes between us and the star. And as it does that, there's a little dip in light because the planet is blocking some of the light coming from the star. And so, again, you don't see the planet and star separate, but if you're just watching the star, it gets a little bit dimmer for a few hours and then brighter again. And if you keep watching the star and wait for however long it takes for the planet to get all the way back around in its orbit, you're going to see the same little dip again. So you measure this dip, you see it happen again, you see it happen again, and you gain some confidence. You do some other tests as well, but you realize, oh, there's a planet orbiting that star. And in this case, we again know the orbital period, so we know how far the planet is from the star. But in this case, we don't know the mass of the planet. What we know is the size of the planet, because a bigger planet will lead to more of a dip in light from the system. And so the depth of that dip is directly related to the size of the planet. Okay, and then the last technique I'm going to tell you about is that I lied. <laughs> and sometimes you actually can directly image a planet separate from the star. So here what I'm showing you on the left is a Hubble image of a star where we're doing our best to block out the starlight. You can see it's not completely effective because light has unfortunate physical properties like diffraction and it bounces around in the telescope and so you see all this noise there. The star is at the very center but we're trying to block out that light. But astronomers are clever people and they do some techniques to get rid of that extra light. And so what you see after you remove all of the starlight is these few dots of light left over. And these are planets orbiting around the star. Now in this case, this technique is best when applied to planets far from the star. Because once they get closer to the star, it's harder to dig them out of the noise. And so all of these planets from this particular system are actually on very wide orbits, beyond the edge of our own solar system in comparison. Now, why is it that I lied to you before? What is it that lets us see these planets? Well, when planets are born, they're born hot, like these metal spheres that I have soaking in hot water. And so, if we see them at an early age, like we'll see with these spheres that I'm going to try to not spill all over the place. This is exciting for me because I don't like do anything in the lab ever. So I shake off the water and then I pour these in here. So here I have a bunch of pretend planets, right? And these are all very hot because they form hot. And they're glowing very bright, right? because they're hot. They have a high temperature, just like these young planets. And you'll notice, actually, that although they all started at the same temperature, the small ones are cooling off very quickly. They're less bright already. And the physics going on here is a little bit different from the exact physics going on with these planets. It's a little more complicated. But it still is true that the bigger planets are the ones that are easier to see. And we want to catch them early on before they cool off too much and become invisible. And you might also notice there's 
these two, you can't see my fingers, they're too cold. There's these two here, this one, which looks a little weird, and this one, uh, the bigger one, the same size ones, right? This one and this one are the same size, but they're cooling differently. And the reason for that is that one of the spheres has black paint on it and the other doesn't. And so that changes how well the heat can escape from the sphere. And planets similarly have differences in how well the heat can escape from the planet based on the atmosphere of the planet. So already I'm talking about atmospheres, because atmospheres affect how these planets cool, which means we can learn something about the planets through understanding how these planets are cooling and how they're emitting light. Okay. I might lie to you some more, but I'll always tell you. <laughs> Maybe. So we have a few different techniques that we use, and they all give us different pieces of information. In all cases, we know something about how far the planet is from the star, but with the Doppler method, we know the mass. With the transit method, we know the radius. And with direct imaging, we know how much light is coming from this planet. <laughs> and the Doppler method and the transit method both preferentially help us find big planets near to the star, and it's harder to find smaller ones farther away from the star. And direct imaging helps us find young, big planets far from the star. And so there's a lot of power in combining, in particular, the Doppler method and the transit method, because stars that have a planet close in are more likely to have that planet transit, and if it transits and the star is bright, we can get both pieces of information, the mass and the radius. So now I'll show you another plot. This time, every dot on this plot represents a transiting planet for which we know both the mass and the radius. And the size of the dot is directly related to the radius of the planet that we measure. And again, on the vertical axis, I'm showing you the mass of the planet, again using a logarithmic axis so that we can stretch out the bottom. And I'm using Jupiter masses, but I've labeled for you the comparison with Jupiter, Neptune, and Earth sitting on this. And this time on the horizontal axis, I'm showing you the distance of the planet from the star. And we're using astronomical units, which means one is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And I've labeled where Mercury sits at, in terms of distance. And so you can see that these planets that we're finding are really close to the stars that they're orbiting around. This huge swarm of Jupiter mass, Jupiter sized planets are 10 times closer to their star than Mercury is to our star. And so we call these types of planets hot Jupiters because we're not very creative and they're very hot. <laughs> And that's the type of planet that I study. And as I go on to tell you about the ways that we can observe atmospheres, I want you to realize that most of them are these big gas giants that sit very close to the star, in part because they're crazy interesting planets, but also because they're the ones that we can most easily detect and the ones that we can most easily apply these different measurements to. But as we continue to observe planets and find planets, we do find ones that are farther from the star, and we do find ones that are lower mass and smaller in size. And so there's another kind of peculiar thing you should realize about this, which is, remember in our solar system, we have the big gas giants, and then we have the small terrestrial planets. But what we're finding is as we're able to work really hard to find these smaller planets, it turns out, that in our galaxy, there are a lot of planets that, in terms of mass and radius, sit within this gap that we thought existed between Neptune and Earth. And so these planets, we debate whether to call them super-Earths, meaning bigger than Earth, or mini-Neptunes, smaller than Neptune. But to scale, this is what's going on, right? We have the Earth which is composed mostly of rock and solid material, and Neptune, which is composed of gas and ice with a little bit of rock at the center. And then we have these mystery planets, which sit somewhere in between. Now, we know the mass and the radius, so we know something about the density, but sometimes that's not enough. 
So sometimes it is enough. Both these jars have the same radius, by which I really mean volume, same volume. But if I look at the mass of this jar, 172, let's say, and the mass of this jar, 380, you can see that this jar is much more massive. This has a much higher density, and so we can say this is the jar that has alcohol in it, this is the jar that has air in it. But sometimes it gets a little bit more complicated. So these aren't exactly the same size, but if I had an extra week, I could probably make two objects that were more the same size. So just play along with me here. Let's say they're the same size. And this is, by the way, wood. And so if we look at the mass of this, 570 or 571, and if we look at the mass of this, 570, same. So in this case, we would have, if we were astronomers and we couldn't actually see the objects themselves, because astronomers don't get much information, we wouldn't necessarily know whether an object at this mass and this volume was composed of water and glass and some metal bits or composed of wood. And now planets aren't composed of water and glass and metal bits, but <laughs> nevertheless, it turns out for, that for these super-Earth mini-Neptunes, we don't know whether they're more terrestrial-like or more gas giant-like because we can find combinations that seem to make sense that can match the mass and radius of these planets. But if we can measure the atmospheres of these planets, then we know what that piece is made of, and that helps us pin down part of the solution and limits what else could go into the rest of it. So again, atmospheres matter. So I'm going to give you a list of the things we can measure about planets. And all of the next of these are going to be about their atmospheres. But first, to remind you, when we have these wonderful transiting planets, we get to know the mass and the radius, which means we know the density, the global density of the planet, and therefore something about its composition, although sometimes we still have mysteries. But how do we measure atmospheres? Well, I want you to stare at this video for a while. And this is actually, you know, created by an artist, but it's got a little bit of interesting physics actually going on in this video. And so I want you to think about, as you look at this planet orbiting the star, we, as astronomers, we don't get to separate the planet from the star visually, but we do get the combined light of both objects arriving at our telescope. So as the planet is orbiting the star, what is going on with the light from the system that's changing as the planet's orbiting. And as you're watching orbit after orbit, you might be seeing a few different things going on, a few different ways that the light from the system is changing throughout the planet's orbit. And as astronomers, since we have limited information, we exploit as much as we possibly can. <laughs> And so we try to take advantage of every different way that the light from the system is changing. So for example, here the planet is about to transit the star. And you see that glow around the edge of the planet? That's the first way that we measure exoplanet atmospheres. So in this case, the planet transits the star. And as I told you earlier, it blocks light from the star. There's a dip. That's how we may detect the planet. But there's also a little bit of starlight that gets filtered through the planet's atmosphere. And the atmosphere is going to affect that light in a couple different ways and give us clues as to what's in the atmosphere, what the atmosphere is like. So here I have a star. It's a light bulb. I'm going to turn it on, but I'm going to put this up so that you don't have to stare at it. And here I have a telescope sort of. And so what's going on, <laughs> thank you, is as we use our telescope to look at the star, you can see this beautiful 
No? You can't see it yet? <gasps> Yay! <laughs> you can see this beautiful spectrum of light coming from the star. Because we take the starlight and we spread it out using something like the prism and we see how much light is coming at these different frequencies, at these different wavelengths. And you can either see it visually as the nice rainbow there, or you can see it uh, in this funny way the astronomers, boring way that astronomers look at it, which is a curve showing the amount of light at different wavelengths. Um, the peak on the left of the screen is a little bit funny. The peak on the right is actually what's coming from the star. But if I were you, I'd look at the rainbow because I think that's prettier. So now I have a planet, or rather planet's atmosphere, which is composed of stuff. And when the planet passes between the star and our telescope, watch very carefully what happens to the stellar spectrum. So you can see very clearly, I hope, that What's in the atmosphere here is blocking light, but it's blocking light at very particular co colors, very particular wavelengths, right? The yellow has completely disappeared. And if you look very carefully, there's actually, whoo, there we go. There's actually also some lines in the green. And if you have really good eyes, maybe you can see some other lines as well, right? And so that particular set of lines we call them absorption lines, give us a clue as to what's in the atmosphere because different elements and different molecules absorb at very particular wavelengths. And so when the planet transits, we compare the spectrum we see during transit, which has a little bit of extra absorption from the atmosphere, to the spectrum we see out of transit, and we know something about what the composition of the atmosphere is. So we get to add another bullet point to this list, the composition of the atmosphere. OK, but you guys are smart. You're paying attention to that video. And you realize that the planet doesn't just go in front of the star. It also goes behind the star, right? So here, I have a planet and a star, starlight, other mysterious switch. And the planet right now is transiting the star. And so when we look at it in the optical visible wavelengths, we very clearly see that the planet blocks out some light from the star. Now, when the planet goes behind the star, it's not much of a difference because the planet is much, much dimmer than the star. You don't really see anything. Oh, I haven't changed it yet. Thanks, so. though. That's a purposeful, purposeful choice. So the reason I haven't changed it yet is because I want to emphasize to you that here we're looking with the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we're used to, visible light. But if we look at a different wavelength and we remember that this planet is sitting, for these hot Jupiter planets, this planet is sitting right next door to the star. And so it's getting very, very hot, right? And so it is glowing. It's not hot enough to glow in the visible, like the stars do, but it glows in the infrared. And just because I have to be a scientist in particular, in this example, the star should still be brighter than the planet. But we don't want to actually burn your eyeballs. So just look at the planet. So now you can see the planet is hot. And so it's glowing in infrared light. And now, if we look at the planet passing behind the star, we're very clearly going to see when we lose that light. So this is like a transit, but the other way around. Instead of blocking starlight, we're blocking light from the planet. And so how much less light we see between when both the star and the planet are visible, if we compare that amount of light to the light when the planet's behind the star, we know how much light had been coming from the star, and that tells us something about how hot 
the planet is. Oh, shouldn't have done that. Maybe this is okay. Nobody's running up, so I think it's okay. Okay, so we know the temperature of the atmosphere, but if you were paying even more careful attention, there's a special time when the planet's moving behind the star, right? We can compare the planet next to the star to the planet behind the star, but we can also pay very careful attention to the time when the planet's just peeking out from behind the star. Because right now, the light that you're getting is just from one side of the planet. And if you wait a little bit longer, the light you're getting is just from the very edge of the planet. And if you wait for the planet to go behind the star and come out the other side, you get a little bit of light from that edge, and then light from most of the planet, but not the very farther edge, and then you get it all again. And so if you measure the light very carefully during these times of ingress and egress, you can find out how much light was coming from particular regions of the planet, which means you know how bright those regions were and how hot those regions were. And this means that you can actually make a map of the planet. And I find this really exciting because this is the first project I worked on in grad school was to figure out if we could possibly do this with planets. And it turned, we thought we would have to wait for the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, but we're like, once that launches, we're gonna be making maps all over the place. Turns out, observers are really cool and did some really careful work. And on the right here is an actual map of HD 189733b a hot Jupiter, where they've used this exact technique of measuring that change in light very, very carefully. Who here knew that we had mapped an exoplanet? Some people, but the rest of you, like, take a moment, we've mapped an exoplanet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What that means is that we're now in an era where we're not just talking about single properties of the planet, right? Before, everything on this list was a single value that we assigned to the planet. Its mass, its radius, the composition of the atmosphere, the temperature of the atmosphere. Now we're talking about the temperature structure of the atmosphere. And this is because planets are three-dimensional. Different regions of the planet are different. And this is really exciting, because it means we have more information about the planet. And it's really fun, because it means we get to build models to try to understand what the planet is like. So, because this is in fact physics, here are a bunch of equations. <laughs> but you also get another demo, okay? And the demo is going to explain the equations. So here I have another star. You might not be able to see, it's a light bulb, which, you know, our favorite type of star. And I'm gonna turn this on. And it's nice and bright. Do I need to adjust this? Okay. <laughs> and you can see what's happening is the starlight is coming over and heating up this planet. This planet is actually an engine. And there's this little strip around the bulb right now, around the tube that the piston's in, that's getting very hot. Because the energy from the star is coming out as light, and the light is being absorbed in the planet's atmosphere and heating the planet. And so that is the physics on the right side here. That's the radiative transfer. When I'm building a model of these planets, I need one part of the model to be taking into account how the starlight gets absorbed and heats up the planet's atmosphere. So this is an energy source. And what's going to happen is that this energy is going to be transformed into a different type of energy. And I probably haven't waited for this to warm up enough yet, have I? Okay. So what happens on the right side of this 
is that I'm solving not just the heating up of the atmosphere, but I'm also solving how then that difference in temperature in the atmosphere gets translated, thank you, into the winds blowing around in the atmosphere. Because I'm going to heat part of the atmosphere more than another part of the atmosphere, and the gas doesn't like to have these big temperature gradients, and so then winds are going to start to flow through the atmosphere. On the Earth, we heat the equator, well, we don't, the sun does, heats the equator more than the poles, and that is why we have wind blowing around through the atmosphere. So in this case, star heating the atmosphere, and then the atmosphere, once it gets hot enough, is going to let this engine start moving around. And you can think of that like the motion of the winds in the atmosphere. Should I try now? Bump it towards the... Okay, well, part of it's not working, because I broke it. <laughs> but I hope you can still kind of actually hear and see that we're driving the winds in the atmosphere now, right? Now, one thing to remember is that these planets are sitting really close to their star. So if this is the size of the star, then the hot Jupiter is sitting right about here. And this means that it's heated very, very strongly, and we expect very, very fast winds. In comparison, if I say, well, the planet's a little bit farther away from the star, and so it gets less light from the star, and I turn this way down, or even all the way off, what you're going to see is that now that there's less energy coming to the planet's atmosphere, the winds in the atmosphere are going to slow down, and because I turned it completely off, this will eventually run down and stop. And you might already be starting to tell that it's running a little bit slower, right? And so the closer planets to the star have faster winds. But beyond that, in order to actually really understand what's going on, we need to solve these complicated sets of equations using a nice computer, nice simulation, and figure out what's going on. And so this is a typical result from one of my three-dimensional circulation models. And what I'm showing you is the temperature in the atmosphere in color. The yellow parts are really hot. The blue parts are really cold. And then you can also see that there's arrows, and that's the direction of the winds in the atmosphere. And so I'm showing you a single slice of the atmosphere right now, high in the atmosphere. And let's do audience participation. Do you think that the star is in that direction or that direction? Yeah, exactly. The star is right off in this direction. So we have a hot day side, and we see part of that, and a cool night side, with winds blowing from the day to the night. But planets are actually a little bit more complicated than that. And so I'm going to show you different depths moving down into the atmosphere. So high in the atmosphere, we have a hot day side and a cold night side. Oh. I don't know why it's not working. I'm going to do a little magic, look at it a little differently. Yes. So now you can see high in the atmosphere, hot day side, a cold night side. And then as we're moving deeper into the atmosphere, the temperature pattern changes and the wind pattern changes in this complex three-dimensional way. So planets are different. They're three-dimensional objects. They're actual places that we can measure properties of. And another way to view what's going on on a planet is if you take the horizontal, horizontal surface of the planet and you flatten it out. And we're used to this all the time with maps of the Earth, right? So the equator is running along the center of the Earth. I'm putting this up for context because I'm about to show you a similar slice from one of these simulations. And this is the temperature at the photosphere of the planet. And that means the level in the atmosphere from which light is emitted. So when we're looking at the planet, this is the level that we're seeing. 
And so the equator's running along the middle here. The point facing the star, the point at high noon on the planet, is in the very center of this plot. And you can see that the hottest region of the planet is actually not at that point. The very strong winds in the atmosphere are blowing the hot gas away from where it's being most strongly heated and blowing it downwind a bit. So there's this shift in the hottest region of the planet. And I don't know how carefully you were paying attention before, but remember that map of an exoplanet? We are learning, as we're observing hot Jupiters, that they also, in many cases, have the hottest region of the planet blown away from the point facing the star. So this is direct evidence that there are strong winds on these planets, moving the gas around. Again, pretty cool. <laughs> but even cooler is what I think we're going to be able to do next. So these are observations that aren't quite there yet, but are the next kinds of headlines that you're going to see. Sneak peek. <laughs> and so back, here we are again with the Doppler shift, right? Now before I told you about the star, the starlight being Doppler shifted, as I swung batteries around my head and try not to kill myself, <laughs> Now, we're actually talking about the Doppler shift of the planet's atmosphere. So when the planet is transiting, when it's moving between us and the star, remember, it absorbs some of the starlight and creates these absorption lines in the star's spectrum. And when the planet's transiting, because of its orbit, it's moving towards us during the first part of the transit and then away from us during the second part. And so during the first part of the transit, all those lines are shifted a little bit to shorter wavelengths towards the blue. And then when it's moving away from us, they're shifted a little bit towards the red. And so through very careful measurement, in 2010, for the first time, this shift due to the orbital motion of the planet was detected. You can see the planet's motion in measuring the Doppler shift of these absorption lines. So that was done. But wait, there's more. In addition to the Doppler shift occurring because the planet is moving relative to the star, the atmosphere itself is also moving. I was just showing you these very strong winds blowing around the planet, and the planet is rotating. So we're going to also get Doppler shifts from the rotation of the atmosphere and the winds blowing around through the atmosphere. And it's a smaller, harder signal to detect than the orbital motion, but we're almost there. And this is very exciting because we may be able to use this to learn something about, to actually measure, or at least constrain, the rotation rates on these planets and directly measure the wind speeds on these planets. So for example, here I've run three different simulations where all I'm changing is the rotation rate of the planet as it's going around the star. And what you're seeing is the flux coming from the planet for different parts of its orbit. And I can compare this to the Doppler shift that you would measure, if you could, <laughs> when the planet's between us and the star due to the rotation and the winds. And this is a little bit harder to visualize, but it's the very outer edge of the planet, right? That the light's shining through. And so here I'm showing you how the outer edge of the planet is shifted relative to us. So the regions that are blue are regions where the atmosphere is the gas in the atmosphere is moving towards us, and red is where it's moving away from us. And this is a combination of the winds and the rotation. So, for example, you see that in the bottom two cases, which are rotating more quickly, one side is a little bit bluer and one side is a little bit redder, and that's because the rotation brings one side towards us and the other side away from us. But in addition, we have these winds that are generally blowing from the day side of the planet to the night side of the planet, which from our perspective is coming towards us. So if you integrate up the effect from all these different regions of the atmosphere, you find that the top two cases 
are blue shifted by a specific number that you don't care about. And the bottom value is blue shifted by a little bit more. So if we can do this observation well enough, we might be able to distinguish the top two models from the bottom model. And you may have noticed that in terms of the brightness pattern on the planet, the top case looks different from the bottom two. And so this means that as our measurements get a little bit better, we might be able to actually measure wind speeds and rotation rates on planets. And so you may have realized this is work that a colleague and I did just this year, I guess, was published this year. And the, the next bullet point is all questions because part of the point of this field is figuring out what are the things that we can measure? How much can we measure? At some point, there are going to be some properties we can't measure, but we're not willing to give up until we've convinced ourselves there's some limit there, right? So, I'm just going to remind you that we're now really in this era where we have tons of planets we're finding, tons more planets that we're going to find, and we're really moving from discovery to characterization. I'm doing well on time, so I'm going to rectify a mistake I made, which is that I forgot one of the demos here. <laughs> if that's okay with you guys. Okay. So one of the other things that we learn about an atmosphere is when the light goes through the atmosphere, sometimes it's absorbed, but sometimes it's scattered. And so this is, we, we are very familiar with this phenomenon because we look up at the sky and we see that it's blue and the sun sets and it looks red. And this is the same effect. So here I have my star. You may have noticed light bulbs are stars. And here I have my pretend atmosphere. And so I have just kind of normal light coming out from the star. And then I put it through the atmosphere. And you may notice that early on in the atmosphere, what you're seeing is blue light. By the time we get farther into the atmosphere, it looks red. And this is because the light that's coming through the atmosphere is being scattered. So it's being diverted towards you or me in all directions. And it's preferentially scattering the blue light more than the red light. So it scatters the blue light and you see it coming towards you instead of going straight through. And by the time you get here, there's not really any blue light left. And so it looks redder. And so we see a blue sky when we look up because the light that had come from the sun goes up into the atmosphere, scatters preferentially the blue light towards us. And when the sun's getting towards the horizon and setting, never look at the sun, never look directly at the sun, but it looks red as it's coming through all of the atmosphere towards us because it's scattered out a lot of blue light. And it scatters more when it's near the edge because it's going through more atmosphere. And I can demonstrate this even more if I use some laser pointers at very particular wavelengths. So here's red. Now, is red going to scatter a lot or a little? A little. So does that mean that the laser pointer should go very far or very short? Can you see that very well? It's a little bit harder with the spotlights. Yeah. But it looks to me like I can see it maybe all the way to here. Thank you. Actually, yes, perfect. Thank you. Can you see that a little better now? Okay. Now, if I have a green laser pointer, what's going to happen? Ooh, okay, wait, let's do the red again, because it got a lot darker. Yeah, I can see the red all the way at the end there, actually, bouncing off the end. And the green one? And the blue one. Barely makes it through, right? And so this means that this is another way we see atmospheres, is as the light... As the light's coming towards us, 
some of that light, instead of being absorbed at specific wavelengths, sometimes we'll just get less light because it was scattered away from us. But we'll see a difference in that red light compared to blue light. And that tells us how the atmosphere is scattering and so something else about the atmosphere. Okay, so I'm glad that even though I forgot that earlier, I got to talk, tell you about it now. And all these cool different methods that we've realized and we're realizing more are being applied to these planets that we're finding in increasing numbers. And so we're being able to characterize these planets, which means that we can really, really be working harder and harder on these questions of understanding how to understand planets and understanding what we can observe about that and trying to work on answering these questions and figure out how much we can possibly know about all these strange new worlds that we're finding. Thank you. <laughs>